Welcome to NCC Unplugged, the podcast from Norman Christian Church, where conversations, community, and culture converge. Welcome back to another episode of NCC Unplugged. Really grateful that you're spending some time with us. Uh, In this episode, we're going to talk about something that has been in the news a lot, Uh, probably, I don't know if I do the math right, seven or eight months and that is uh, the ongoing war in Israel. And the point of today's episode is not to uh, take a political stance on one side or the other saying, hey, this is the side of this war that you need to support or you need to go out in a protest in this way, but actually to discuss uh, from a spiritual viewpoint some of some of the, the things that we see happening in the world and how they have spiritual implications potentially, potentially not. Um, and so I've really invited Garrett in to talk about, you know, what are the the different ways people see current events playing into the story of Scripture, uh, what God has given us in His Word. Um, you know, some people are throwing words out like end times and the apocalypse, and this is the war to end all wars, and there can be some hysteria behind it. Others... Uh, push it off as nothing, just another conflict in our w- world. Uh, some see uh, the Jewish na- nation as as God's people, and so they're really watching this with um, just a, a great heightened awareness. And so, Garrett, maybe just, just turn it over to you. Give us, if you can, a general sense of your understanding. Um, how How do we look at things like this that aren't aren't just another war being played out, but to to potentially more things happening behind the scenes and spiritual implications. What are some of the things that you've heard and understood and uh, would, would want our podcast audience to hear? So I think first it's important to note that um, this isn't something that's been in the news just for seven months. It's been in the news for 2000 years. Yeah, I mean like, and, and even Jesus said, in his um um what's known as the Olivet Discourse, where he gives his um teaching on the Mount of Olives and um all three of the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which just basically means they all share a similar source. Mm-hmm. Um they all record this discourse, this teaching. And so anytime you see in the in these gospels a recording of the same event, especially when it's recorded in a very similar manner, it's kind of an attribution it it kind of attributes greater significance to it. Mm-hmm. Not that it's more important than any of the other parts of the gospel, but it's 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 stuck out stuck out in the minds of the gospel writers. So that what's a distinction of the Olivet discourse um Jesus is talking about the end times, the end of the age, um, and one of the things that is mentioned is you will hear wars and rumors of wars, mm-hmm. and there will be disasters and, and earthquakes and famines. These are just the beginnings of of birthing pains, and so I think a lot of times Jesus, in, in his foreknowledge, knew that so often we attribute disaster and um, wars and hardships and things like that to end times. It's cultures all throughout history have done that. And what he's emphasizing is we should not look at everything through this spiritual lens. But that doesn't mean that nothing should be looked at through a spiritual lens. So there is importance to it. Mm -hmm. And so the question of how you view the importance of Israel and and what's going on in the Middle East is it really comes down to a question of how you interpret Scripture, um, and it's a question of how you interpret Scripture in either a um, a way that unifies the whole of Scripture or disunifies. Um, it's called continuity versus discontinuity. So if you read scripture as one story where the entire whole of the corpus of scripture is a meta narrative that's going on, mm-hmm. 
then how you understand Israel's role is different than if you read it as discontinuitous, whereas there's a lot of pockets of different stories that, when added together, equal scripture, but each pocket is its own story. And so those two different interpretations, the, f- the first one, which is called continuity, is, is known as covenant theology. And the second one, which you vo- where you view scripture in different pockets, is called dispensationalism. And where you fall in those two different spectrums often impacts how you understand the church's relationship with Israel which will then often impact your political view and impact um, the way you see some of the things that are going on there, especially in regards to the end times and prophecies and and stuff like that. So do you think most people that hear this news in Israel and and want to take a position have thought through those things as far as, oh, do I see Scripture as a continuous story? Or are they maybe taking the the teachings of others that they've grown up with or hear on TV or radio or whatever. And yeah, that's a great question. I don't think, I think more in the, um, mid 1900s was where people took harder stances on how you view scripture. Um, so another, um, aspect of theology that makes it into this is um, post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, all-millennialism. So what that means is whether or not you believe that in in the book of Revelation and in Thess- Thessalonians, there's this reference of a thousand-year reign mm-hmm. um, of Christ. Post-millennialism is Christ, the, the thousand-year reign of the church happens, then Christ returns. Mm-hmm. Pre-millennialism is Christ returns, then the thousand-year reign happens. Gotcha. All millennialism is the thousand-year reign is more analogical and and um, mm-hmm. um, not metaphorical, but it's it's symbolic of something mm-hmm. deeper. Um, so all of that to say, post-millennialism became a very popular view in the '70s. Yep. One of the big proponents of it was um, Jerry Falwell, mm-hmm. um, senior, not. Junior, I wouldn't take theology from Junior, um, but Jerry Falwell Senior was was a big proponent of it in the seventies, and um, you know, and then the advent of Liberty University helped kind of promulgate that view. If you're a view of post millennialism, then you view Israel and the Church as distinct entities, and the existence of Israel is paramount for the existence of the millennial year millennial reign of the church. Mm -hmm. So if we want church, if we want Christ to come back, the church and Israel must be distinct and reign for Christ to return. So that emphasis of post-millennialism came out of an evangelical adherence to dispensationalism. Gotcha. And so dispensationalism, um, to, to quote, <clears throat> kind of one of the big proponents of dispensationalism, which is um, Ryrie. I can't ever remember his first name. Is it James? James Ryrie? Charles. Oh, Charles, Charles Ryrie. Um, <laughs> thanks Ryrie, for saying James. Was the Ryrie Ryrie. Study Bible was popular one time? Yeah. Um, so Ryrie, Charles Ryrie has a systematic theology um, book that um, came out in the 90s or no, 1900s. That was kind of a staple. Um, um, so he and, and people like Nelson Darby, John Nelson Darby and um, C.I. Schofield. So these are names that people probably don't understand or know. But anyway, they're huge proponents of dispensationalism. And one of the tenets of dispensationalism is that, and I want to read this to make sure I get it right. Um, it, it teaches that the permanent land or earthly fulfillment of God's promises to Israel um, extends both to Israel and the church. Mm. So the new earth would belong to Israel. The new heavens would belong to the church. And that came out of this view that there are certain promises that are distinct to Israel and certain promises distinct to the church, which came out of a view that what is called literal interpretation, that's 
the fulfillment of scripture has to be fulfilled to those to whom it was originally given. Mm -hmm. Um, So a literal interpretation doesn't mean you take scripture more seriously than a covenant theologian would. Mm -hmm. It just means you say that scripture was written to this specific people. So if you have the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they were written to a post-exilic people of Mm -hmm. Israel. The fulfillment of Jeremiah and Ezekiel has to come to those to whom it was written, the Mm -hmm. post-exilic Jews. Mm-hmm. So there's, in the mind of a dispensationalist, there is virtually zero fulfillment in Ezekiel and Jeremiah that pertains to the church. Yeah. It all pertains to Israel. Mm-hmm. That's a dispensationalist yeah. view. So let me try to get a metaphor here to to try to understand this as we talk about it. If we're talking about dispensations like, like train cars, mm-hmm. and they're all going in the same direction, it's all God's plan from the start, but the train cars, for the most part, are disconnected. Yeah. And so the promise to the first train car was to the Jews in the Old Test- Testament. We could break it down even mm-hmm. further than that, that there are several train cars to different groups of people. Uh, as Christians, we're maybe the last train car. We get a separate promise yeah. of a new heaven. And so the promise to that train car remains in that train car. Yeah, Covenantalism or covenant theology is saying it's more like a bus. It's all connected. Yeah, so... I mean, the metaphor is going to break down yeah, somewhere. But, yeah, so but, uh, the way that I draw it, because typically when I teach about this, I, I use a whiteboard, and I draw circles um, mm-hmm. for dispensationalism. So typically dispensationalists will... And that's the thing about dispensationalists. They, there's a lot of disagreement. Um, some will say there's five dispensations, some mm-hmm. seven, some ten. Um, but they all believe that there's different dispensations in Scripture. So you draw a bunch of circles. Mm-hmm. And each circle is each dispensation within Scripture. And there's not really any overlap. And the last dispensation is the one in which all the seven, somehow there's an integration, but it's also a distinction Mm -hmm. from that. Gotcha. Now, one of the reasons I, you know, not to show my hand, but I'm not a dispensationalist. And one of the reasons is that there is, if you are take it to the nth degree of dispensationalism, you would have to affirm that there is multiple, God has multiple, um, as Ryrie calls it, programs for salvation. Mm -hmm. So the program of the law was one of God's programs for salvation, just Mm -hmm. as the program of Jesus. And a dispensationalist would say, since Jesus is the law, he was the same program to the Jews in their dispensation of the law of Moses as he is to the church. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of issue with that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I'm not. And a dispensationalist would probably argue for that more eloquently than I would. Covenant theology separates scripture into um, three covenants. So you have the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption. The covenant of works is everything that is post fall of humanity. So from that point on, we had to work to maintain our relationship. Yeah, after Adam and Eve. We had to work to maintain our relationship with God. And that covenant was codified in the law of Moses. Yeah. Here's the works. Yeah. All all of what here's the works you have to do to to build the ladder to God. Mm -hmm. The covenant of grace comes in fulfillment in Christ. But you also see the covenant of grace during the era of the covenant of works, you know, because um, as uh, Paul writes in Romans, Abraham's faith was credited to him as mm-hmm. righteousness. Mm-hmm. It, it, there was grace involved through through his faith. Um, his faith wasn't a work, so to speak. So there's, there's overlap and integration, and then ultimately the covenant of redemption is the covenant that's always been there, that God has always known of the fall of, that he's always known of the necessity to save humanity. Mm -hmm. So he uses Israel as his people, which becomes the church as his people. So Mm -hmm. in covenant theology, there isn't a distinction between Israel and God's people. It's just God's people. Israel was God's people. Now God's people is the church and Israel and the minds of strict covenant theologians isn't unimportant Mm 
historically, but is not a part of God's people now. Right. Um, so I'm not a covenant theologian either. I'm what's called a progressive covenantalism, which means that I believe covenant th- theology is the more ap- accurate representation of Scripture. But I think that that covenant and that meta narrative of Scripture that is encapsulated in all these three covenant covenants progresses forward. And that there is a distinction between Israel and the church, but to be God's people, you have to have Christ. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, in Revelation and in, in end time prophecies, Israel is is recognized as distinct. So there has to be a distinct Israel in God's mind, but being ethnic Israel or national Israel doesn't make you God's people if you're not in Christ, if that makes sense. So that would be in the mind of a progressive covenantal theologian mm. and also a progressive dispensationalist. So there's four different streams yeah. and you can get really deep into it. Um, but the question is, is how you view Christ or how you view the church in Israel. And um, that is based on how you interpret scripture as mm. a whole. So this becomes relevant to today when we look at Israel being a nation, because if I'm a dispensationalist, am I saying in order for me to get what's promised to me, they need to get what's promised to them. Yes. Yeah. So I have, I have uh, a dog in the fight in Israel mm-hmm. because I want, I want what's what's true about you said the word program or the promise or the dispensation about me to be true to. Yeah. And so if God's going to fulfill what's true about me, he needs to fulfill what's true about them. Because if he doesn't, then yes. he's not a God that finishes his exactly. work. Exactly. Um, That's the mind of a dispensationalist. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, we're, we're not getting too political, but was this was this view of, of faith and Christianity influenced in politics, you know, when Israel became a nation— uh, in the '70s, do you do you know where this started becoming a popular position so in the United States? Dispensationalism gained its name in the 1800s. Okay, um, it gained its popularity with the rise of what's called modernism, mm-hmm. um, and modernism is a type of philosophy which is thinking through an analytical lens. So it's A plus B equals C, so to speak, um, and coming out with a singular truth, um, which, which you know, is the modern type of philosophy I subscribe to. But it's also where source criticism came from. Modernism brought source criticism. So I know those were some big words, so I'll try to explain it a little bit. Source criticism is critiquing or studying a source based on where it originated from. Mm -hmm. So you don't read scripture as the holy word of God, first and foremost, you read it as a document written to a specific people in a specific time in a specific place. And so dispensationalism began in the 1800s from people who are trying to take serious the word of God Mm -hmm. and then some might disagree on this. I believe that it was commandeered a little bit by modernism and source criticism in the 1900s and became this, what well, was written to this specific people in this specific time, in this specific place. So it has to be fulfilled in this time, mm. place, and people. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where dispensationalism by the 70s comes into then, um, which then means that in order for the dispensation we're in to be fulfilled, all of the promises that were made to this other people have to be fulfilled as well. Mm -hmm. And so the two have to go hand in hand. That sort of mindset isn't, didn't, wasn't birthed in, in the 1800s. Um, it, it came out as early as, um, uh, the two hundreds by a guy named Marcion, um, who viewed, the Old Testament as written for the Jews and the New Testament is written for Christians. Mm. And so the point in saying that is 
the role of Israel within the interpretation of Scripture has been there since the church came on the scene. Mm -hmm. We've put different names to that role and have interpreted Scripture differently, not differently, but more holistically and fully as time has gone on. I would say we're in a place now where we would disagree with Marcion. We wouldn't say that um, the Old Testament is for Jews and the New Testament is for the church, but dispensationalists would say the Old Testament is fulfilled is fulfillment for the Jews and teaching for the church, and the New Testament is fulfilled for the church, not necessarily the Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can go a lot deeper into all of this as well as far as how you interpret prophecy and, and things mm-hmm. like that, yeah. different lenses. So let me try to clarify a few things that you're not saying. Okay. Uh, you're not saying we shouldn't be uh, involved and concerned about Israel and world politics. Yeah, no. I, I don't think whether you're a covenant theologian or a... If you're a dispensationalist, you would have your view of scripture would necessitate that you're very involved in what's going on in Mm -hmm. Israel. If you're a covenant theologian, your view of grace and redemption should necessitate your view of what's happening Mm -hmm. because of some of the chaos and crimes and, Mm -hmm. and horrors that are happening. If you're a Christian, you should be concerned. Yeah. Um, Like absolutely. That's straightforward. How you view scripture as a whole is going to probably determine the length to which you go and, and the specificity you go mm-hmm. and in your um, views and your application. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yep. I think another thing I hear, you, you're you not saying um, Israel is just another nation, but they're also not... Uh, a nation that has free reign because they have the favor of God to do whatever they want. Yeah, and I would say that's the church too. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if we if we say the church is God's elect, which is what you know Paul identifies us, Jesus I doesn't Jesus only uses the word ecclesia, which is the word for church in two instances in all of the gospels. Mm-hmm. Um so the formal church as it is today Maybe it was it, it definitely existed in the mind of God, but it wasn't formalized in words until the apostles. Mm-hmm. But there is a, a definite um, there is a, a even though we are considered God's elect, God's people, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that we now get to go and do whatever we want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I think anyone could agree with that. Mm-hmm. And so that same applies if you are a dispensationalist and you look at Israel and you shouldn't, you can't say, well, now that just means that they get free reign to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, But on the flip side, you also have to look objectively and say what's being done to them, what's happening in the Middle East. And as Westerners, we have to realize we are so far removed from what's going on there Mm -hmm. that what we see in the media is a fraction of a fraction of what's taking place. Mm -hmm. And so we can't really trust just a single news outlet or a single um, article or a single, you know, something that's on our TV Mm -hmm. and say, that's enough information. Yeah. You know, there's so much going on there that's deeper than we can really understand because it's thousands of years of history. Mm -hmm. Um, Islam came in in the 600s um, and and kind of took over the the near ancient Near East. Um, and Israel had been dispersed at that point um, because of a lot of other conflicts and stuff going on. And so from that point on, as Israel's trying to get back to the Middle East, and as Catholicism is taking their views on the Holy Land, and you have all these tensions with the Holy Land wars and stuff for hundreds of years the Middle East has a bloody, bloody history. Mm -hmm. Um, Not just since Christ, but, you know, a thousand years before that. We can't fathom something that has 3,000, even 4,000 years of histories of war. Mm -hmm. 
we've been in a country for 200 years mm -hmm. and have had one war yeah. in our midst, yeah. like within our country. Is the Middle East has been an establishment for many different countries for 4,000 years and has had thousands of wars. It's just, a, we, it's apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And so we can't necessarily, we shouldn't go into it with a Western lens and say, this is what I think should happen because we just don't know their experience. Now, and like you said, the, the reality of the situation is hard to know too. Yeah. I mean, you get reports of, of what's happening and sometimes you just have to question the source or, you know, how they know what they know and, and all of those things. So, um, Joshua, you got your Bible open? Were you going to read? Well, Garrett was talking about just the different ways to view the Old Testament, you know, and, and what and how is was it just for you or just for the Jews or us? And this might apply, Romans 15, verse 4. It says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So uh some would look at this as referring to the the old law and to the benefit that it still had for those of us living under the the teaching of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the thing with whichever view you take, covenant theology, dispensationalism, is it passages like that have to be interpreted differently. Hmm. So a dispensationalist would read that and say it's beneficial for teaching and understanding who God is, but it's not written to the church. It's written to Israel. Mm -hmm. A covenant theologian says, no, this is God's word. It's written to all of God's people, which, you know, is Israel. It's the church. And and it's got the same, it has the same um, implications, the same timelessness to it um, throughout. And so I guess all of this to say, if you're, as Christians, our view of the world the way that we immerse ourselves into politics and, and social life has to be dictated by Scripture. Um, but the reason why there are Christians that disagree with other Christians on things like stuff like this mm -hmm. is because there's just simply different ways that people interpret Scripture. And I don't think, I, I don't want to like, come off to say that universalism is the is the way to live because it's not but i think as you talked about in your sermon series a while back with the boxes mm -hmm. there are things that go in the essential box things that go in the important box and the not important box in scripture god's word goes in the essential box what's difficult is okay if god's word is in the essential box where do we put the interpretation of God's word? Mm -hmm. If it's in the essential box, do, do I put covenant theology in the essential box because that's how I interpret scripture or dispensationalism in the essential box? I wouldn't, but then that leaves the question open to disagreement. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of church splits end up happening because one church will say, well, I hold scripture just as essential as you, but you don't view it the right way. Right. And so that's where these things come apart. And so I think at the fundamental level, there also needs to be an ordering of the essential box. And so what's at the bottom of the essential box? Mm -hmm. It's the glory of God and our um, heir and co-heir in Christ, mm -hmm. that we are who we are because of Christ and we are who we are because it brings glory to God. And scripture is the witness to that meta narrative, to that truth. Um, and from there, there are different ways that we interpret the application of that. Yeah. Um, and I did, with that, we need to have an understanding that we can have disagreements on those interpretations. And those people we have disagreements love God just as much as we love God. Yeah. And they're trying to be intellectually, uh, intellectually as honest as we are. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, that takes a lot of generosity on our part and a lot of trust that God is a big God. Yeah. And uh, we I need... I th think at the end of the day, too, what we ask ourselves is, 
is my dispute with this other person, this other Christian who's reading this differently than me, is my dispute and anger and frustration towards them glorifying God and mm-hmm. the body of Christ? Yeah. And if it's not, then we need to rethink how we're handling our disagreement. Very good point. Um, because the essential box, like I said, if we order it, is is God, Christ, and then the mm-hmm. Word. Mm-hmm. They're all in the essential box, but how we interpret the Word should come from the way that we glorify God and who we are in Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks a lot, Garrett, to bringing bringing some light on this situation and how we process it. I mean, our hearts go out to those in the Middle East. I mean, we don't have, Mm -hmm. here in this room, we don't have any experience living in in a war zone. We don't have any experience uh, not being able to to get food when we go to the grocery store because there's blockades and aid that's being stolen. And just some of the things that we hear, again, we don't know the truth of all of it, but we, we do know... Um, it's a war-torn region. Violence just hurts people, and so our hearts and our prayers go out to them. I hope as you've listened, you're you're going to offer more prayers and uh, just some thoughts on your own theology, potentially, where you land on this, and at the end of the day, uh, just relying more and more on God uh, for His goodness, because we know our hearts don't produce that goodness uh, in ourselves. It, it just... Um, brings about more wars and violence and hurt. And so we lean on God in these times and um, just uh, offer more prayers in that direction. So thanks again, Garrett. Thank you, Joshua, for being with us as well. And uh, just really appreciate you listening to another NCC Unplugged and hope to join you next time. Thank you for tuning in to NCC Unplugged. If you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we encourage you to share this with your friends and family. NCC Unplugged is available on all major podcast platforms. And if you're ever interested in experiencing Norwin Christian Church firsthand, we invite you to join us for our services every Sunday at 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. We have engaging classes available for all ages, ensuring there's something meaningful for everyone in our church community. For more information about NCC or any other inquiries, visit norwinchristianchurch.com 